I would like to think the work is for in part the, the people of Mobile. I'd like to think it's in part for folks that are really trying to open up their heads and hearts to their own fears and where those fears come from since the snake seems to be the stand-in for fear. All of the work is thinking about American mythology, um, American history, as it relates to the uh, symbolism of the snake. And so we have um, a mix of installation pieces, sculptural work. A lot of the work has to do with fibers um, and pulling kind of uh, imagery from popular culture, found objects. Uh, newspaper articles and speeches, examples from song lyrics, from film that has used snakes in it. The temper and conduct language is directly pulled from an essay by Benjamin Franklin. And he wrote it, I believe he wrote the essay under a pseudonym called An American Guesser. And in the essay, he's specifically talking about the temper and conduct of America and making a comparison directly to snakes snakes that don't want to attack. They don't want to waste their venom on something that they can't eat, but that they will defend themselves if needed. We created the um, idea for the exhibition before we knew about the story of snakes in Mobile um, and the founder of Mobile, who was um, supposedly covered in t uh, tattoos of snakes, led us to want to collaborate with some local tattoo artists, which has been really an exciting um, connection. When you look up descriptions of, of Jean-Baptiste's tattoos, they're very different. Some talk about a singular snake coiling around his body that were, was applied to his body by the indigenous people um, in what is now the Mobile area. Um, but we, we don't know these things. History tends to evolve quite a bit. It's like a game of telephone that we played as a child. Each time the story is told, it evolves a little bit. And that goes back to this core interest I think Katie and I share about the folklore and mythology surrounding um, Jean-Baptiste's tattoos. We, we don't know all the exacting motivations behind that. I've really been thinking for the past several years about the Gadsden flag, which is the flag that you might know for the phrase, don't tread on me. It's a yellow flag with a rattlesnake coiled. And the history of that flag and how that image of the rattlesnake has been used is, um, is really um, strange to me, you know, like why the rattlesnake um, becomes a symbol of the United States of America when the rattlesnake is actually native to both Central America and the US. Some of the work I hope is a little bit funny and maybe disarming so that an audience that might not think about this concept in the same way that I do might be engaged by that humor um, and then for themselves start to question how, how that flag is used or what they mean when they might use that flag. Snakes are really powerful symbols in a lot of native cultures and so to say that that belongs to one group of the population isn't really fair, right? Like, in the flag pieces within the show, those pieces are all images of native snakes to Alabama, both venomous and non-venomous snakes. The language on the flag, instead of saying, don't tread on me, it's saying, please don't, or better not, you better not, um, as a way to kind of say, like, is it submissive, is it passive, um, or is it a threat? And how can we um, look at these things in different ways? The interest has grown in perhaps maybe a more academic sense um, is it seems to be like the biggest fear, the biggest shared fear globally. Um, snakes are something feared regardless of country or creed. It is usually on like the top three of like most feared lists when you could kind of look into it, which I find really fascinating. It's used quite a bit in Judeo-Christian history, but also globally. You see snake iconography and snake parables used in Hindi and Buddhist history and Native American histories. Um, and it's interesting that these stories, these um, this folklore 
has evolved so equally regardless of continent and conversation between these different places. So the fact that it is a sort of sign of mortality and defense for me in particular as a maker right now in the sort of current state of, of US politics and US global relationships, it very much balances this kind of common fear that we have and fear being this core motivation for hate, for ignorance, for bigotry. Um, it seems like a very flexible symbol in those senses, which I appreciate a great deal. Elements in the exhibit are probably twofold in nature, um, creating these sort of stuffed snakes, these stuffed creatures. And, you know, a lot of times we make cuter animals into stuffed children's toys. Um, to do it with snakes has got a sort of embedded absurdity that I find refreshing, hopefully. The satire comes a bit from Benjamin Franklin's uh, satirical cartoon that lets us join or die underneath it. And it was done a few years before the Revolutionary War broke out in, in sort of response to taxation and other issues happening um, with Britain at the time. And this, this chopped up snake, this sort of like um, gut punch to the sort of political landscape of that time um, always stuck with me. I remember learning when I was a kid that Benjamin Franklin, besides being sort of considered part of the, these founding forefathers of the United States, was a printer. Um, he, he knew how to duplicate imagery. He was a writer. He was a, 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 an experimenter, a scientist, like um, this sort of a, epitome of what an American res Renaissance man may, maybe could be. Haiti and I started from a point of departure of Franklin, but going more to kind of revolutionary history and the, and the co-founder of Mobile and Jean-Baptiste. So there's hopefully some sort of local takeaways that are really specific and unique to Mobile. You know, there's kind of an educational bent, I think, to the work. Like, I'm interested in the way that information is carried. Um, sometimes the work might feel like bizarro infographics, and that's really exciting to me because it um, maybe helps people question the way that facts are, are communicated um, in culture. So even, you know, within this work, which is um, heavily influenced by this piece of writing that Ben Franklin did during the Revolutionary War era, if you, you can read his writing in really different ways, it's my hope that we can have a conversation about that. Jean-Baptiste had a hand in a lot of uh, coastal cities, a lot of um, river cities and development in the sort of French southeast of the United States, which I think is important to kind of understand. None of us know Jean-Baptiste directly, none of us know Benjamin Franklin directly, to, to have known how, how great and how also flawed man can be. Sort of knowing one's history, knowing who the supposed founders are of your place can really open up smart questions about, well, who was missing? We have all this research and speculation um, and records on Jean-Baptiste, but we don't necessarily have that same information on the indigenous folks he was corresponding with, trading with, um, making deals with in the growth of this part of the United States. Um, and we're, we're not necessarily gonna find that information, but I think it's important to note that there, there's a gap there. Um, and when we understand where the gaps are in American history, we may become a more inclusive place, an inclusive country because of that.